Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so our screencast today is going to focus on the presidencies of Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter, but we're going to focus on foreign policy. In class, we looked at the big domestic issues facing America. Today, we're going to take a look at the big foreign policy decisions that are made by Nixon and Carter throughout the 70s. So we're going to start with Richard Nixon and his approach to foreign policy. If you have a minute, I will pause the video right here and read through the quote, because it kind of gives you a synopsis of Nixon's foreign policy. But Nixon is going to work very intimately with the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, to come up with what they deem to be a very realistic view of the world. They don't see the world with absolute enemies and absolute allies. They're going to pick and choose when to ally themselves with foreign countries and basically how to play one country off the other. So they take a very realistic approach, approach to foreign policy. Now, Nixon does extend the policy of containment. It's not like he rolls that back, uh, but he's going to um, use his background as being so known as such an anti-communist uh, person from his past and history to be able to kind of approach China and approach Russia in a way that a lot of other presidents haven't. So what I want you to keep in mind, remember, we can't look at the Cold War as a monolithic foreign policy. Yes, Harry Truman sets the precedent of containment, and Eisenhower builds off it with the, with the Eisenhower Doctrine. But remember, each president kind of has his own approach to the Soviet Union and to China, and it's important to know like the ebbs and flows of the different presidencies. So Nixon's first big foreign policy issue he has to deal with is dealing with the Vietnam issue. So as we talked about in class briefly, uh, what Nixon is going to do is he's going to follow a policy known as Vietnamization, which means He's slowly going to turn over the war from U.S. ground soldiers to Vietnamese ground soldiers. And we've seen this in recent wars, too. We did it in Iraq. We did it in Afghanistan in recent wars. So the policy is to get American ground troops out. You know, while we're there, we train Vietnamese, in this case, South Vietnamese soldiers, to continue the war to stop, the po stop containment. But we're taking, actually, American troops out of, you know, Vietnam. Now, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it because of how unpopular Vietnam is. Now, I like this political cartoon because uh, it's kind of showing uh, Vietnamization almost as like a scarecrow, that it's not fooling anybody. It's not fooling uh, anybody. And uh, eventually what's going to happen in Vietnam is that North Viet once the United States is going to pull out, so Nixon is essentially going to move us out of Vietnam. And once the United States moves out and ground troops move out, uh, eventually, North Vietnam conquers South Vietnam, and so it doesn't re it's not really a lasting foreign policy, but it's popular. That's important to understand. It's a popular foreign policy at home, uh, pulling the troops out of Vietnam. So this is known as Vietnamization of the Vietnam War. Uh, now, at the same time that he's pulling troops out of Vietnam, he is escalating conflicts in Cambodia and uh, nearby South, uh, South Asian countries. Uh, so they were using this as, the, they call this the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they're using this kind of coming through Cambodia into South Vietnam. And so uh, Nixon escalates bombing along this uh, campaign, or along this uh, travel route, uh, which is, it depends on which political party you are back home and how you view this, uh, but a lot of Americans just want us totally out of this area completely. Uh, so it's po unpopular in certain circles. Uh, now, what Congress does in 1973, if you remember when we go, we, we talked about the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and how that gave the president extended power to send troops overseas uh, without a declaration of war, they kind of learned their, their error here and they passed the War Powers Act, which limits how long a president can deploy troops overseas uh, without having congressional approval. So there's a limit on it. And this stands today with the War Powers Act. Um, he can only send troops over for, uh, I believe it's about 100 to 200 days before he needs official congressional approval for uh, whatever kind of action is being taken place. And this is a direct relation or a direct result of the Vietnam War and the experience during Vietnam. Now, like I said before, Henry Kissinger is his uh, security advisor, secretary of state, and he has a big influence on Nixon's way of thinking. And like I said, Nixon takes the approach of very realistic 
policy. So a term that they use is they use the term realpolitik to describe some of this foreign policy that Nixon is going to, you know, is Nixon is going to use as, as the President of the United States, which means uh, you do what's best, what's in the best self-interest of the country, whether it is morally right or morally wrong. You don't put morals into politics. It's not about morality. It's about gaining the best advantages for your country. So we're first going to see this with China. So China had their communist revolution in 1949 and officially became a communist nation. Uh, and at that point, America kind of just distanced itself and had no relations with China. And we've been interested in China for years. If you remember, we tried the open door policy during the imperialist period uh, in the 1890s. Because uh, China is a great market for American goods. So Nixon decides he can use this to his advantage. What he realizes, and a, a less astute politician or a foreign policy president wouldn't have noticed this, is that China and the Soviet Union are not seeing eye to eye anymore. They're not kind of working together. Even though they're both communist countries, they're different communist countries. So he's going to practice this policy known as reproachment which means he's going to try and extend and try and get diplomatic relationships going with China. So he actually goes and uh, he starts like, you know, some kind of diplomacy. We sent our ping pong team over there in 1971. Uh, and Nixon himself is going to go over and visit China. And what he realizes is that if he can open up China, you know, with the United States, he can play China off the Soviet Union and play the Soviet Union off of China. And he's smart about this. And if you look at this, what Nixon is trying to do is open up the Chinese market, which is a huge market for American manufactured goods during the era. Now, fast forward 30 years, 40 years to our time period, China sells tons of manufactured goods to us. But this relationship begins really with Nixon and Mao, and then later, um, you know, when Deng Xiaoping takes over, you're going to have kind of the extension and the expansion of uh, this relationship and kind of uh, when China starts to change a bit as a country. Well, but it starts under Nixon when he kind of reaches out to China. Now, the other country that he's going to reach out to, which is going to be the Soviet Union, which is very surprising. So Nixon comes into office as this hardline anti-communist leader from his background. Remember, he's, he's one of the investigators in the, in the Second Red Scare. Um, but he actually takes a much more realistic approach to the Soviet Union because he knows uh, if these two countries don't have to be on friendly terms, but if they're not at total odds with each other, if there's some kind of relationship, some kind of uh, diplomacy going on here, the world's going to be a, setter, a safer, better place, and American goods will be able to uh, traverse the globe a lot easier. So Nixon's policy that he's going to pioneer something called detente, which simply means easing of tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. So here in this Time Magazine article, you see him uh, dealing with uh, the Soviet premier of the time, which is Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, and so this is kind of a, a revolutionary policy. So this is an easing of the tension. You, you know, during Kennedy and those time periods with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the tension rises. Here you have an easing of tension. They're meeting each other. Uh, the, Nixon goes to the Soviet Union. He meets them. They also sign this agreement called SALT, uh, which is, means strategic arm limitation talks, which they're talking about limiting the production of nuclear weapons, which is a big step. Remember, they're building on nuclear weapons for all this time, and now they're actually discussing limiting how much they're making. So this is an ease in the Cold War. Um, at certain times, it gets more... Uh, Hence, at certain times it eases, and Nixon's a big part of that. Uh, so like I said, Nixon goes and he visits the Soviet Union. So one of the things I want you to keep in mind about Nixon, uh, when you compare Nixon foreign policy and domestic policy, uh, Nixon is really a successful foreign policy president in a lot of ways. He's still dealing with the aftermath of Vietnam, but he does a lot of things that will be considered positive. Uh, his big stain is his domestic problem, his domestic scandal. Kind of the opposite, I think, of Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson's big stain is Vietnam, is the foreign policy, and he's looked at as potentially, you know, doing a lot of good things domestically. Nixon, I think, is looked at the opposite way, as a, as a pretty good foreign policy president, but not really uh, that great on the domestic side.
All right, the next president we're going to take a look at is Carter, who kind of rounds out the 1970s for us. Now, Carter believes in a very different approach. His approach is something known as multilateralism. So this is essentially what the Carter Doctrine is. Uh, multilateralism is the opposite of unilateralism, which means, multilateralism means that when you get involved into international crises, you don't go alone. The United States doesn't go alone. We're not going to try and solve problems alone and kind of be like the global police officer. We're going to work with a coalition of nations to try and solve issues around the world. So you've seen presidents recently uh, adopt this policy. Like Barack Obama definitely has a multilateralism policy here. Um, so he subscribed, it's not the Cold War anymore, but he subscribes more to like a Carter-esque uh, foreign policy. And uh, Carter believes that this is going to, going to uh, improve our relations around the world, both with our allies and with our enemies. Uh, he also, the other important aspect of the Carter Doctrine is he does believe in moralism as a part of foreign policy. Uh, and that plays a role. So he's different than Nixon, a very different approach than Nixon does. Now, because he believes in multilateralism, he's not just going to focus on the big players in the world, like the Soviet Union and China. He's going to reach out to different parts of the world and kind of uh, get America involved in other areas, especially what's going to start to be, take center stage in this time period is the Middle East is going to, I will not say take center stage, but the Middle East um, starts to become a significant part and, and spoken about part of the world as far as our par foreign policy. It happens in the 70s as well with the with OPEC and these different uh, crises that are happening, um, but it starts to take a little bit more of a, of a role in uh, Americans' minds as far as foreign policy is concerned. Uh, so something that famously Jimmy Carter presides over is the Camp David Accords, uh, which are peace, talk, peace talks between uh, the Egyptian leader and the Israeli leaders of the era. So, you know, the Palestinian-Israeli wars uh, and the wars between surrounding Middle Eastern countries are huge problems during the 1970s. Uh, and Carter's going to try and play like um, global uh, negotiator, global um, peacemaker. And he invites these leaders to Camp David, which is like the presidential retreat, uh, to try and hammer out their problems. And they do sign kind of like this peace accord. Uh, now, the Egyptian president is eventually going to get assassinated for signing this peace accord, uh, but nevertheless, it is kind of a big step uh, in the Middle East, and it also kind of shows you Carter's approach, that he feels like he can help in the world and taking this moral approach, this moral guideline approach to foreign policy. Now, the next big crisis, which really gets Carter into a lot of issues, is going to be dealing with the next major ideological battle that the United States is going to, going to engage in. Uh, so the first one that we've been talking about is communism and fighting against the expansion of communism. What you see here in 1979, the event we're going to talk about is the Iranian Revolution led by a guy named the Ayatollah Khomeini. This revolution is America's first big taste on a major level with Islamic fundamentalism and this kind of conservative backlash against Western society. Uh, and so famously, what's going to happen here is uh, Iran is going to have a conservative revolution, overthrowing uh, a leader that was pretty much pro-Western and pro-United States. Uh, the Ayatollah is going to kind of be the face of this revolution. And famously, he calls America the great Satan. So. What, what they don't like about the United States is they don't like kind of all of the Western influence that they're bringing into the Middle East, and in particular here, Iran. So you have a religious fundamentalist back, backlash against Westernization, American culture, American way of life, uh, that contrasts with traditional Islamic beliefs. And so they really want America out. They want American influence out of the country. It's a conservative movement back to a more religious, more conservative uh, state in Iran. And there are other countries that have people who believe in these ideologies too, throughout, trickle throughout the Middle East. So what's interesting here is that this happens in 1979. So America is still dealing with what they, most Americans would call the major threat here, which is the Soviet Union stopping communist expansion. But it's the beginning of the next big era in American history, which is dealing with Islamic fundamentalism, terrorist organizations, uh, 
and people who kind of see Western society in America as, again, a major threat. It's another ideological battle. And as Americans now, we live in the middle of this. We live in the middle of this ideological battle that's happening with modern equivalents like ISIS and Al-Qaeda that, you know, we had to fight wars against in Afghanistan. And so this is something that's been dominating American politics for the past, you know, 25 years, in a big way, the last 15th of September 11th. Now, what happens during the Iranian uh, revolution is they're going to uh, capture the uh, American embassy in Iran, uh, and here they are burning the American flag on the top of the embassy, but what they do also is they take people, workers in the embassy, American workers, and they, and they hold them hostage. Uh, so it's roughly about 300 hostages that they take, uh, and they're going to hold them uh, for over a year, about 440 days they hold the hostages for. Now this is seen as uh, Carter, one of Carter's biggest problems and one of his biggest failures as a president um, is his inability to get these hostages released uh, or brought back to the United States. Uh, it's kind of seen as he totally is being inept as the president here. Um, and this Time Magazine article or t uh, cover really kind of illustrates what a lot of Americans were feeling at the time that this country here is blackmailing us and they're making us look foolish on the world stage. And this plays a role in Carter losing, uh, the, you know, not getting, not getting a second term. Uh, and we're going to have a new president who is a Republican kind of come in, Ronald Reagan, who solves this issue basically on his first day uh, within office. And so Carter, I think, is seen as somebody who has a lot of optimism, somebody who had good intentions as far as foreign policy, but didn't necessarily execute uh, the way that Americans would have hoped. Uh, so when we come back to class, we're going to pick up with Ronald Reagan and his approach to his domestic approach and his foreign policy approach, because uh, his ideology is really going to shape the 1980s, and it also shapes modern America in a lot of major ways. So we'll pick up with that when we come back to class on Monday.